Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Tomorrow marks one year since Russia invaded Ukraine, starting a horrific war that has so far cost so many innocent lives. I want to pay tribute to the people of Ukraine for their courage in standing up against Vladimir Putin, and I know we will all continue to support the people and the government of Ukraine in their fight against this evil dictator. Since we were last in this chamber, the First Minister has announced her resignation, and the front-runner to succeed her is Hamza Youssef. But during his time as Health Secretary, Scotland's NHS has lurched further and further into crisis. The Scottish Conservatives have received a Freedom of Information request, and it's uncovered just how awful things have got at accident and emergency departments over the last few months. This new information, which we are publishing today, reveals that a patient in the borders waited 49 hours to be treated in accident and emergency. Someone in Lanarkshire waited 54 hours. And a patient in Ayrshire waited 60 hours at accident and emergency. First Minister, that is two and a half days in accident and emergency. Surely no one can defend that. So doesn't this confirm that Hamza Youssef isn't even up to the job he's got at the moment? First Minister. Firstly, pres Presiding Officer, can I also take the opportunity uh, to mark uh, what uh, will be tomorrow the first anniversary of Russia's illegal, unprovoked invasion of Ukraine um, and to express my solidarity, uh, the Scottish Government's continuing solidarity and I'm sure the solidarity of everyone in Scotland with the people of Ukraine as they continue to defend and protect uh, their sovereignty, their territorial integrity yeah. and their independence. Um, Parliament uh, this afternoon will uh, debate this issue. This evening I will host uh, a reception in Butte House for Ukrainians in Scotland and our thoughts uh, remain with them at this difficult time for them and their country. Um, on the issues of the National Health Service, uh, firstly, I, I, I should say it is, of course, for uh, the members of my party to elect uh, a new leader uh, of the SNP um, and uh, effectively a new uh, First Minister for Scotland, subject to approval of this uh, Parliament. But can I say in relation uh, to the Health Secretary, uh, he is the only Health Secretary anywhere in the UK that has managed to avoid a single day of strikes in the National Health Service over this period. Secondly, notwithstanding the very significant challenges in accidents Thank you. and emergencies. Thank you. I would be grateful, members, if we could hear the First Minister. Thank you. I, I can understand why the Conservatives are feeling uncomfortable. Uh, of course, the Conservative Government in England has not managed to avoid strikes in the National Health Service there. They also, they also get uncomfortable uh, when they hear me point out again uh, that despite the very significant challenges in our National Health Service, which I'll come on to in a moment, uh, Scotland's accident and emergency departments remain the best performing yeah. Yeah. anywhere in the UK. And if I may say to the Health Secretary, that's not down to him, that's down to the hard work of staff across our National Health Service each and every single day. But our Health Service faces significant issues. We see that in the Audit Scotland report published today. But we also see in that Audit Scotland report important context that, of course, Douglas Ross always seeks to deny. Uh, so let me quote from it. Page 7. The pandemic continues to affect the delivery of NHS services. To listen to Douglas Ross and others, uh, you would be forgiven for thinking the pandemic hadn't even happened. Uh, secondly, Scotland's NHS is not alone in facing these issues. 
Uh, many of the factors contributing to the extremely difficult situation facing the NHS in Scotland are not specific to health services and many are not within the control of the Scottish Government. Uh, notwithstanding that, we continue to support our health service to ensure record funding, record staffing, record pay deal for Agenda for Change staff in Scotland and progress in reducing the longest waits in our National Health Service. Douglas Ross. Shameful. Shameful is the only way you could describe that answer from the First Minister. Because not a mention, not a mention of a patient who waited in Ayrshire at the tail end of last year for two and a half days in accident and emergency. The clue is in the name. They went there for emergency treatment and they sat for two and a half days. And the First Minister her answer to them is, well, it's the best performing anywhere in the United Kingdom. That is little comfort for people who are waiting hours and days for treatment. And the First Minister might not have noticed, but when I sat down raising these shocking statistics, Hamza Youssef smiled and smirked. The Health Secretary thinks it's funny that people are waiting for days to be seen in A&E in Scotland. And, and the First Minister mentioned and quoted from the NHS uh, Audit Scotland report into NHS. Let's remember, BMA Scotland said of the report this morning, it is damning of the state of the NHS currently. The report outlines that Nicola Sturgeon's chosen successor won't meet NHS job targets. It says performance declined further in 2022. The number of people experiencing extremely long waits increased in 2022. And performance on cancer waiting times is getting worse. Every part of Scotland's NHS is in crisis because of Hamza Youssef. So can the First Minister tell us, is this useless Health Secretary really the best the SNP have to offer? The First Minister. Well, in relation to uh, individual cases, it is always unacceptable if someone waits too long for treatment in the National Health Service. Um, and at the tail end of last year, which of course uh, was Douglas Ross's phrase, uh, that was during the winter peak of pressure. Since then, in accident emergencies, uh, there is still considerable progress to be made, uh, let me stress that, but we've seen eight hour and 12 hour waits uh, reduce, um, and we continue to support our accident emergency departments uh, in further progress. Uh, we are also uh, seeing, uh, Douglas Ross mentioned recruitment, uh, we have record numbers of staff in our NHS right now. Since this government took office. Uh, we have increased NHS staffing by 28,800 uh, people within the National Health Service. We've got higher staffing per head of population than in England or other parts of the UK. Uh, we've got funding that has doubled in our National Health Service. We've got higher funding proportionately uh, than anywhere else in the UK, to the tune proportionately of about £1.8 billion, equivalent to 44,000 nurses in our National Health Service. And yes, we have significant work to do to reduce waiting times. Uh, we are focused uh, firstly on the longest waits, and we've seen significant progress in reducing the longest waits. Uh, but the reason uh, I, I did make the comparison and do make the comparison with other parts of the UK is because Douglas Ross stands here and tells us uh, and asks people to believe that these problems are unique to Scotland yeah. uh, and somehow down uh, to the Health Secretary in Scotland. And that's where the Audit Scotland uh, report is instructive because it says uh, that these issues are not unique to Scotland. I'm quoting from page seven. Scotland's NHS is not alone in facing these issues and many of the factors are out with the control of the Scottish uh, Government. So we will continue to do our job working with and supporting the National Health Service and we will do that uh, despite Douglas Ross's determination to turn it into a political weapon, which I think we've just seen all too clearly. Douglas Ross. Wow. Wow. Opposition MSPs raising cases of people waiting two and a half days in a and &E in Scotland is somehow a political weapon. No, it's not. It's the reality of people across Scotland just now. 
And the First Minister loves to make this comparison between Scotland and the rest of the UK. Let's just remember, the UK Statistics Authority said Public Health Scotland's figures and the statistics Nicola Sturgeon uses for the comparison can be misleading for patients. Misleading is what the UK Statistics Authority said. Now, we know that Hamza Youssef uh, released a recovery plan that everybody, everybody could see was just a flimsy pamphlet. The First Minister has now quoted page 7 twice of the Audit Scotland report. Let's go a bit further. I've looked through the whole report. The Audit Scotland report says of Hamza Youssef's recovery plan, it lacked detailed actions. They said he didn't do detailed and robust modelling. He didn't, and this is a quote, engage fully with NHS boards. And information on key patient aims is missing. Information on key patient aims is missing. Hamza Youssef have made the crisis in Scotland's health service much worse. First Minister, why should a health secretary who has failed our NHS now get to fail the whole of Scotland? First Minister. Well, firstly, I, I didn't suggest that any MSP uh, raising patient experience uh, was using it as a political weapon. Uh, what I said, and what I will say again, is trying to suggest that these issues are unique to Scotland's NHS, is seeking to use our NHS as a political weapon, and to coin uh, a phrase of Douglas Ross, presiding officer, I do think that is shameful on the part of the Conservatives. <laughs> on the recovery plan, let, let us look at the progress um, and it is the case uh, that we have considerable work still to do but let's take uh, eight and 12 hour a and e weights uh, i said earlier on these have dropped significantly since the peak over the winter period uh, eight hour weights are down by 54.9 percent 12 hour weights down by 61.6 percent uh, that's because of the support we're giving to the nhs and the work of staff on the front line uh, look at waiting times targets uh, more generally the numbers uh, waiting the longest for treatment have reduced by almost a quarter uh, for both inpatient and day case treatment and for outpatient treatment. Uh, so there are significant challenges, more significant than at any point in the history of the NHS, uh, but we are supporting our NHS with record funding, record staffing and the wider support it needs to address these challenges and that's what uh, this government will continue to do. Douglas Ross. Oh dear. Yeah. Eight years ago. Eight years ago, a failed SNP health secretary became first minister. Now, history looks like it's repeating itself. Why, why would anybody risk Scotland's future by giving a man with Hamza Yusuf's record more power? So let's, let's just look at his time in office while the First Minister gets more intel from the Deputy First Minister. I don't know what's coming there. So let's look at what Hamza Youssef has done uh, in office. He was Transport Minister who drove without a licence. He delayed the duelling of the A9 and he clapped like a seal when Nicola Sturgeon launched a ferry with painted on windows. He was Justice Secretary who did nothing while violent crime rose, got duped by a hoax video into calling on the police to investigate Rangers players and damaged free speech with his hate crime act. And now, now Hamza Youssef is the worst health secretary since devolution, but it looks like he's going to fail upwards. In any other line of work, Hamza Youssef would have been sacked, not promoted. Forget being SNP leader. Why is he even still in government? First Minister. Well, I don't know about anybody else, presiding officer, but Douglas Ross is sounding pretty scared yeah. of Hamza Youssef. As I am sure he will be, as I am sure he will be scared of whoever is elected to succeed me as SNP leader. Thank also, you, members. Thank you. He all. also referred to the fact I was health secretary uh, before becoming first minister. As uh, I am extremely proud of, presiding officer. But let me just reflect on this fact. In the eight years that I have been First Minister, the people of Scotland have had no fewer than eight opportunities to cast a verdict on me, my party and my government. And in every single one of these eight opportunities, the people of Scotland have rejected the Conservatives and put their trust in me, my party and my government. And I have every confidence, presiding officer, that whoever succeeds me as leader of the SNP will continue that record of success. Thank you. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. 
Uh, officer, can I start by echoing the comments of both Douglas Ross and Nicholas Sturgeon on the ongoing war in Ukraine and send uh, the solidarity of everyone in my party with the people of Ukraine against the tyranny of Vladimir Putin? Uh, officer, Nicholas Sturgeon and I disagree on many things, and it's fair to say we have had our fair share of stooshies over the years, and I am sure we will have many more in the years to come. But I think it is important to note that she has been at the forefront of Scottish politics for 20 years. She has served in government for 15 years and been First Minister for eight years. And in that time, she led our country through a global pandemic, a challenge for any leader anywhere in the world. And for that, she deserves our recognition and our respect. Thank you. Presenting officer, the, the Audit Scotland report. Sir, the can, audit... can, we please do, can we please give Mr. Sarwar the courtesy of listening? Thank you. Presenting officer, the Audit Scotland report on NHS published today makes grim reading for the government. It supports what patients and staff have been saying about waiting times and concludes before the COVID 19 pandemic, NHS boards were already struggling to meet waiting time standards for planned care, and performance has deteriorated further since. Uh, this report confirms that COVID didn't cause the problems, uh, that they were there before COVID, but of course exacerbated uh, by COVID. After nearly 16 years of SNP government, what went wrong? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I thank Anna Sarwar for his uh, generous comments. I uh, fear it might be damning him with faint praise to say he's got more grace uh, in his wee finger than all the Tories combined. Uh, so, although... Although I'm sure, I'm sure he'll balance it out over the course of these exchanges. And finally, on that point, uh, presiding officer, I am definitely showing my age here uh, when I reflect on the fact that one of my earlier election contests uh, was when I stood against uh, Anna Sarwar's father. Um, and my most recent electoral contest, of course, uh, it was against Anna Sarwar himself. And I'm going to spare his blushes by not pointing out the result of the latter one, even though his father beat me fairly and squarely uh, back in the day. Uh, look, turning to the important matter of the NHS, uh, our NHS does face the most significant challenges uh, that it has at any point in its history. Uh, that is largely because of the pandemic, but as I have reflected before, pre the pandemic, there were challenges in our health service, changing demographics, uh, ever-increasing expectations of what health services can deliver, in themselves positive trends, but ones that nevertheless uh, pose challenges for the, the health service. Uh, what has changed over the years that we have been in government? Well, funding for the National Health Service has doubled. It's higher proportionately than it is in any other part of the UK. Staffing in our health service has increased significantly. We are seeing, and the Auditor General in his report this morning recognises this, we are seeing the signs of reform and innovation uh, so that we can equip our health service to cope with these challenges. Uh, so I do not deny the challenges, uh, but what the NHS needs and has is a government that will continue to support it and focus on addressing these challenges. That's the responsibility of government and that's what I believe the people of Scotland uh, deserve and want to see continue. Anna Sarwar. I should say lightly that the Nicholas Surgeon does need to remind me of the difference in the 1997 result and the 2021 result. My dad does that often enough uh, for both of us. <laughs> um, the truth is this government took its eye off the ball when it came to the NHS and it didn't prioritise the NHS like it should have done. Um, they weren't prepared uh, and they still haven't caught up. Uh, the Health Secretary launched his NHS recovery plan in August 2021, but according to Audit Scotland, current activity is running well below NHS recovery plan targets. Uh, more people are being added to waiting lists that are being removed from them, and people are waiting longer for treatment. Performance against cancer waiting time standards is getting worse. Longer waiting times are negatively impacting people's health. And finally, the number of people dying each year is still higher than average. Things are getting worse not better. The report is damning and it is clear Hamza Youssef has failed. He published a recovery plan that was more about spin than substance and as a result patient outcomes are getting worse, staff are burnt out and the NHS is going backwards. So does the First Minister finally accept the conclusions in Audit Scotland's report? First Minister. 
I do accept the conclusions in Audit Scotland's report. The challenges on our National Health Service are significant. Uh, the recommendations in that report are important, and we will seriously consider each and every single one of them. Uh, staff have been working incredibly hard, and I uh, recognise the description of, of burnout that many NHS staff will feel. That is why it has been so important to give them the fairest possible pay increase and ensure that, unlike the situation in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, NHS staff have not had to go on strike in Scotland uh, to get that decent uh, pay offer uh, that has now been made. And as an aside on that issue, uh, to bring NHS staff Agenda for Change nurses in England up to the level uh, of those in Scotland, uh, the UK Government would have to offer a 14% pay increase to them. Uh, that is the gap that now exists. Um, but in terms of our focus on the National Health Service, uh, we have doubled funding for the National Health Service since coming to office. Uh, the budget passed this uh, week in Parliament increases NHS funding by a further billion pounds. Frontline spending in Scotland is 10 per cent higher than in England. We have got more staff. We have got more staff per head of population than in other parts of the UK. And on uh, waiting times, yes, there is much there to do, uh, but we have seen a reduction in the longest waits. We have got a number of national treatment centres opening this year, uh, which will see an additional 12,000 uh, procedures able to be undertaken in the National Health Service. Uh, although cancer waiting times are, are challenged, as all waiting times are, we are seeing more patients being treated on the key cancer pathways. Uh, so much work to do, but a real focus on this government in supporting our National Health Service, uh, because that is our responsibility. Anna Sarwar. Officer, it's important we look at the facts. The number of people waiting for over a year for inpatient treatment when Hamza Youssef became Health Secretary was 22,000, already too high. According to Audit Scotland, that number now stands over 35,000 people. When he took charge of the NHS, 84.1% of people were seen within the 62-day cancer standard. Now that is just 74.7%. More than one in four cancer patients are not being seen in time. And the week Hamza Youssef was appointed Health Secretary, 3,448 people waited more than four hours in A&E. This week that number is 7,572. It's more than doubled, even though fewer people are going to A&E. On every single measure, this Health Secretary has failed to get the NHS back on track. In fact, this is the worst it has ever been. So does the First Minister really believe that the man responsible for, for failing Scotland's NHS should be responsible for our country? First Minister. That's a decision for uh, members in my party. Uh, but can I say this? Since Hamza Youssef became Health Secretary, and this is what Anna Sarwar uh, never wants to mention, there have been, I think, three further waves of a global pandemic uh, that have affected health services all across the UK, Europe and the world. That's not something that can just be ignored. Uh, we, in common with other countries, have also uh, just come through one of the most challenging winters uh, that any of us can remember. That's the context uh, for the challenges in our National Health Service, context that is recognised and indeed uh, pointed out uh, by the Audit Scotland report today, which says, and I repeat, the pandemic continues to affect the delivery of NHS services. Scotland's NHS is not alone in facing these issues, and many of the factors uh, are not within the control of the Scottish Government. Uh, but we continue to support the NHS in the ways I have set out, record funding, record staffing, record pay rise uh, for agenda for change staff, uh, reform and innovation to change how patients go through the National Health Service uh, and action to reduce waiting times. Uh, this is something uh, that is going to take time to properly recover the NHS from the pandemic. That's true in Scotland and in other countries. But the focus of this government will not waver. It never will waver in supporting our National Health Service and all those who depend upon it. Question number three, Gillian Mackay. The First Minister whether the Scottish Government will provide an update on how it is responding to the Climate Change Committee's report on progress in reducing emissions in Scotland. First Minister. Scotland is taking action to secure a net zero and climate resilient future and doing so in a way that is fair and just for everyone. Our focus remains uh, very firmly on delivering the updated climate change plan, delivering on our adaptation outcomes through the 2019 adaptation programme and planning for a just transition across the economy. Uh, we are also carefully considering the Climate Change Committee's latest advice and plan to respond in the spring. Julian Mackay. In recent years, Scotland has shown real climate leadership on the global stage. 
I am proud that the Scottish Government is currently consulting on a position that would see a presumption against exploration for yet more oil and gas in the North Sea, while taking real action to build more solar, wind and marine renewables. That action must add up to a plan that delivers on our climate commitments and delivers a just transition for our communities. Does the First Minister agree that Scotland's new climate plan will be one of the most important plans this Government will ever produce? And will she join me in calling on all parties to rise to the challenge, come together and take the climate emergency seriously? First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I do agree. I think addressing the climate emergency for the sake of this generation, but also generations to come, uh, is a massive obligation. It is, I think, a moral obligation for all of us, and I hope everybody across this chamber uh, would have the same conviction in tackling climate change uh, as I do and as uh, the government uh, does. Gillian Mackay is right to point out the need for all countries to move away from fossil fuels, to accelerate the move away from fossil fuels. Uh, there's an added reason uh, why we need to do that in Scotland, because of the maturity of the North Sea uh, Basin. So uh, even if there wasn't a climate emergency, uh, which there is, we would have the need to make that just transition. So investing in the transition, investing in the alternative sources of energy is really important. And of course, we are blessed in Scotland uh, that we have an abundance of those alternative sources of energy. That's why Scotland is so important. It's why our hydrogen, green hydrogen ambitions are so important, because they allow us to make the transition uh, for energy needs, but in a way that is just and fair and supports those who currently work in oil and gas uh, into alternative employment. So that just transition is one of the most important obligations of government uh, and why the updated climate change plan will be one of the most important documents published uh, over the period ahead. Maurice Golden. Thank you, President Officer. Creating a circular economy is a key component in reducing emissions. A series of reports by Circle Economy assess the circularity metric of different countries. The Netherlands scored almost 25 per cent, Northern Ireland almost 8 per cent, and after 16 years of SNP rule, Scotland came last with just 1.3 per cent. Why? First Minister. Well, look, there's many initiatives that we are taking to make our economy uh, more circular, to, to reduce waste as well, and it's important that we continue with those. But we have much, much more to do. Uh, that's why we're committed to a circular economy bill. But the Conservatives would be more credible uh, on these issues if they didn't, in a very knee-jerk uh, way, oppose everything that we no. bring forward to try to improve performance <laughs> around the circular economy. Like, deposit return scheme, uh, for example. Uh, so, so let us focus on what we need to do better, uh, but let's try and find a bit of consensus uh, in order that the country can do exactly that and live up to that obligation that all of us have. Question number four, Fiona Hislop. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government... Excuse me a moment, Ms Hislop. Can we have Ms Hislop's microphone? Thank you. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the future role of women in driving entrepreneurial activity and economic growth in light of the publication of the report Pathways, a new approach for women in entrepreneurship. First Minister. Uh, on Monday, I had the pleasure of visiting the Roslyn Innovation Centre and was able to welcome uh, Anna Stewart and Mark Logan's outstanding report. Uh, the report sets out a range of detailed and very ambitious recommendations uh, looking at how we close the gender gap for women in enterprise, uh, how we do that across the government, education system, enterprise support networks and wider society. Uh, this is an issue, uh, first and foremost, of fairness. There are clear barriers facing women in realising business and ambitions, including access to start-up and growth finance. Uh, but it's also important for our economy. Uh, if women started up businesses at anything like the rate men do, uh, that would deliver a significant boost uh, to our economy as well. So this is an important piece of work, um, and I look forward to seeing its recommendations implemented. Fiona Hislop. I would also like to thank the First Minister for the strong leadership she has shown to women throughout her tenure. This report is an important milestone for women in business. It notes that only 2% of institutional investment goes to women-led companies in Scotland. So does the First Minister agree that we must increase the support for women entrepreneurs as tapping into this latent pool of talent is not only the right thing to do, it also has that potential to significantly boost Scotland's economic activity and growth. 
First Minister. Um, I completely agree with that and thank Fiona Hislop uh, for that question. Uh, supporting women into enterprise and, and closing that gender gap is, as I said in my initial answer, more than an issue of fairness. Important though that is, it is also one of economic necessity. Uh, women, of course, are uh, slightly more than half the population, but only around one in five businesses in Scotland right now uh, are led uh, by women. We need to change that. Uh, and the recommendations in this report, which span uh, a whole range of factors, uh, from some of the cultural barriers that women face to the systemic barriers to things like access to finance uh, will all be important in helping us do so and I uh, certainly probably from a, a different definitely from a different place than I'm standing in right now uh, look forward to continuing to support in this parliament uh, the full implementation of the recommendations and again let me thank Anna Stewart and Mark Logan for all the work uh, they have done to produce the report. Thank you. Question number five, Tess White. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to research by the Royal College of General Practitioners reportedly showing a third of Scotland's GP staff who were surveyed said their practice was at risk of closing in the next few months. First Minister. Well, I well understand the difficulties that general practice is facing right now, particularly uh, during what has been uh, and continues in some respects to be a, a challenging winter period. So let me firstly put on record my thanks uh, to GPs and their teams across the country. Uh, a record number of GPs are working in Scotland. Uh, we have also recruited more than 3,000 healthcare professionals uh, since 2018 as part of the wider uh, primary care multidisciplinary teams. Um, I very much value the work of the Royal College of General practitioners. They are a very important partner and the survey is important, albeit I should point out that the survey sample is relatively small, just 181 Scottish respondents from many thousands of general practice staff. Nevertheless, uh, of course, we pay close attention to the findings of it. Uh, we must encourage more trainee doctors and healthcare professionals to work in general practice and we'll keep working with the RCGP and others to ensure that this is an attractive proposition. Tess White. This week, GPs in the North East have sounded the alarm that general practice will become an extinct profession. And they point the finger at a blatant and shameful lack of support from the Scottish Government. That's a direct quote. Freakham Medical Centre, Invergari Medical Centre, Wallace Town Health Centre, Burghead and Hopeman GP surgeries and 5E Old Meldrum Medical Group in the North East. They've closed, will close, or have handed back their contract. And Audit Scotland have warned again today that the key target to increase the GP workforce by 2027 is not on track. Can the First Minister explain why the action her government is taking to address GP recruitment and retention is failing miserably, and it's putting patient safety at risk? First Minister. Firstly, general, general practice uh, is a really important part of primary care. Primary care is a really important and increasingly important part of our entire uh, national health service. So we will continue to support general practice as, as part of that wider team. I, I said earlier on, we have recruited since I think 2018 more than 3,000 healthcare professionals to work in these wider multidisciplinary teams, and we will continue to do that. In terms of the GP recruitment target, that's a target for 2027. I believe we are on track, although as Audit Scotland rightly says, eh, that will be challenging, eh, but we will continue to focus eh, on that so that we do meet that target and continue to ensure that we are making general practice an attractive proposition for those uh, wishing to pursue medical careers. Uh, these are extremely important issues and, and these times are very challenging for all parts of our National Health Service. Uh, but the hypocrisy of Conservatives in this chamber really is breathtaking at times. Uh, let me just end this answer, Presiding Officer, with this uh, statistic. Uh, the number of GPs per 100,000 of the population in Scotland uh, is 95. Uh, where the SNP is in office, where the Conservatives uh, are in office in England. It's not 95, it's just 78. So yes, these are challenging times, uh, but this government uh, is showing and can evidence how we are showing support for general practice and for the NHS as a whole. Jackie Bailey. I'm afraid the First Minister's government is not on track and indeed Audit Scotland have said they will miss the target of increasing GP headcount to 800. But it's worse than that. 
because whole time equivalent GP numbers have decreased by 200 since 2013, and this poses a serious threat to the recovery of primary care. At the same time, the number of patients registered with GPs has risen by over 300,000. Yet the SNP have this year cut £75 million from primary care and GP budgets. Does the First Minister not agree that by slashing funding and failing to increase the number of GPs, the SNP are compounding the crisis in primary care and ultimately failing GPs and their patients? First Minister. Uh, no, I, I don't agree with that. I do agree these are extremely challenging times for GPs uh, and for everybody who works in our National Health Service. Uh, the target in terms of GP recruitment is a target for 2027. Of course, we will have to focus and work uh, to meet that. Uh, with the greatest of respect to Audit Scotland and I uh, take everything they say very seriously. I'm not sure anybody can look to 2027 and predict uh, what is going to happen. They rightly point out that it will be challenging, uh, but it is important that we remain on track. In terms of uh, GPs, we have seen uh, GP headcount increasing already uh, by 277. Uh, we've seen the wider multidisciplinary teams increase by more than 3,000. Uh, and of course, that is increasingly important because GPs rely on other health professionals to help them do the excellent job they do. And come back to the last point I made uh, in response to the previous question, we have more GPs uh, proportionately uh, than other parts of the UK. I mentioned England earlier on. We've also got more uh, than Labour-run uh, Wales uh, per head of population and more than in Northern Ireland. So much work to do, uh, but we do it in Scotland from a position of relative strength. Question number six, Martin Whitfield. Very grateful, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what recent action the Scottish Government has been taking to keep the promise to young people in care. First Minister. It is the ambition of this Government that every child in Scotland grows up uh, loved, safe and respected so that they have the opportunity to reach their full potential regardless of the circumstances in which they are born. That's the commitment of this government and it is a personal commitment of mine uh, that I will take with me uh, as I leave this government uh, over the next few weeks. Uh, the budget that was passed on Tuesday commits almost £80 million uh, to the promise and £50 million uh, to the Whole Family Wellbeing Fund. Uh, back in December we introduced the Children's Care and Justice Bill, uh, which seeks to put an end to under-18s in young offenders institutions and ensure that children who come into contact with the care and justice system are treated with trauma-informed and age-appropriate support. Uh, last Friday, I was delighted to visit East Renfrewshire to celebrate Care Day. Uh, I always value the opportunity to hear what matters uh, directly from children and young people across Scotland as we work together uh, to keep the promise, which, as I say, uh, is a commitment I hold personally as well as for the time being as First Minister. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful to the First Minister for that answer, but as she remits her office, many in the care sector are deeply concerned as to whether the government will follow through with its pledge to uphold the promise. And I absolutely welcome the First Minister's personal assurance that this for her will be a lifelong commitment. But after nearly two years since the launch, and with only three years to go, there are serious questions about progress. So would the First Minister agree that any failure to deliver the promise will be nothing less than an abject betrayal of some of the most vulnerable children in our society? And will it be herself as First Minister or her successor who would be held responsible for that? First Minister. I will always feel responsibility for the promise, uh, whether I'm in government uh, in this parliament or, or whatever I happen to be in, in future stages of my life. Um, I have absolute confidence that whoever succeeds me as First Minister will share my commitment uh, to keeping the promise and delivering on that. But let me make this promise of my own. If I at any point think that this government or any future government uh, is not doing that, then there will be somebody up there in the back benches uh, being very loud and very <laughs> vocal about it. And you can hold me to that. Cool cap, Stuart. Uh, I welcome the Scottish Government's ongoing commitment to keeping the promise to our care-experienced young people. Can I ask the First Minister how next year's budget allocation of the £50 million that she mentioned for the whole family wellbeing programme will indeed support families that are in need? First Minister. The Whole Family Wellbeing Fund is really important and something I am extremely committed to and will want to see uh, delivered and, and continue to be delivered. We talk about young people in care and it's really important that any young person 
uh, in care is loved and supported and is safe and secure uh, and nurtured. Uh, but one of our biggest responsibilities is to try to prevent the need for young people uh, to go into care by supporting families and keeping families together where we can. Uh, that's the, the purpose and the objective of the Whole Family Wellbeing Fund, to transform services so that families can access support they need when uh, they need it and in the way that they need it. And when I was in East Renfrewshire on Friday, I spoke to uh, one mother in particular who told me uh, about the importance of that early intervention uh, approach in ensuring uh, that her daughter was able to stay with her and didn't have to go into care. So it's going to focus on uh, the system changes required to shift investment towards early intervention and prevention, uh, which is a critical part of how we keep the promise in practice. The £50 million investment in this year's budget uh, includes £32 million provided directly to children's service planning partnerships to support uh, work at a local level and further details of the programme proposals uh, will be confirmed in due course. Um, many things have been important to me uh, over my years as First Minister and I'm sure I'll get opportunity to speak about some of that over the next few weeks. Few if anything uh, of these things has been more important to me than the promise uh, to care experience young people. Our society should be judged on how we care for and love the most vulnerable children uh, that we have um, and I think this parliament as a whole not just this government uh, should be committed uh, to ensuring that every young person is loved and nurtured and if we do that uh, then we'll have something genuinely to be really proud of. Ross McCall. Uh, thank you and I note the First Minister's personal commitment. Uh, Fiona McLean of The Promise said I uh, quote for so many care-experienced children, young people and care-experienced adults, their lives won't have improved over the last two years and things will have been really, really hard and may have even gotten worse. It's heartbreaking and shameful and it shouldn't be the case. So does the First Minister agree that two years into the promise it is simply unacceptable that the lives of care-experienced people are still no better? Yeah. First Minister. I... I, can I thank the, the member for a question? I'm, I'm not sure, forgive me if I'm, if I'm getting this wrong, I'm not sure if she was referring to Fiona Duncan uh, of The Promise. Um, and Fiona has said many things, done uh, fantastic work uh, with the care review and, and now with The Promise. And I know uh, will be somebody uh, who seeks to hold all policy makers and, and government ministers to account on this. Uh, of course, uh, there is much to do. The experience of the pandemic has been tough for everybody, uh, but for those already vulnerable and already marginalised, it has been particularly tough so there will be many respects in which for uh, young people in care that has been the experience of the last two years but you know we talk about the promise and we have been talking about it I've been talking about it today in the abstract we have already done uh, so many things uh, to improve the experience of young people in care and when I speak to young people it is often these things that they cite to me the, the care experience bursary for example I've spoken to so many uh, care experienced young people who've had the opportunity to go to university only because of that bursary we introduced taking some of the other costs away whether that's dental uh, charges or, or council tax uh, burden. These practical measures uh, are important because they are about levelling the playing field and they are about giving opportunity. Do we uh, have more to do? Absolutely, we've got more to do. Um, and we will absolutely have to rise to the challenge of keeping the promise. And I know everybody across this chamber, I hope everybody across this chamber, is as committed to that uh, as I am. And I will be, continue to be a very loud and I hope a powerful advocate for care experienced young people as we do collectively as a society keep the promise uh, that came uh, much later than it should have done for them, but which we now have, all of us, have a responsibility to deliver in full. We move to general and constituency supplementaries, and I call Rona Mackay. Thank you, presiding officer. We know the Scottish Government's commitment to the excellent research and science which takes place in universities across Scotland and the impact this has on patients and communities most in need. Given Cancer Research UK's decision to withdraw funding from the administrative base of Scotland's only clinical trial unit, the Beetson Institute, in my constituency, can I ask the First Minister whether the new cancer strategy will reflect the importance of place-based research in addressing regional inequality in cancer in Scotland, particularly in the west of Scotland? First Minister. Well, the cancer strategy uh, 
will publish in the spring and it will set out our 10-year uh, vision for uh, cancer in Scotland, including building on the significant strength Scotland has in research. Uh, we've recently published an independent report on improving equity of access to cancer clinical trials and we'll be working with the cancer research community to prioritise the recommendations in that report and take forward as many as feasible. Uh, can I take the opportunity to recognise absolutely the very high quality of research in the West of Scotland through collaboration between the Beetson Institute, University of Glasgow and the NHS. To support this, we have recently increased our contributions to Glasgow's Experimental Cancer Medicine Centre, uh, which will receive over two and a quarter million pounds this year. We're also committed to supporting the NHS Research Scotland Cancer uh, Research Network in running innovative, high-quality research studies across Scotland. Sue Webber. First Minister, paediatric audiology services in NH Lothi NHS Lothian have well-documented issues. Constituents of mine have a four-year-old daughter who suffers from progressive hearing loss and has been waiting over 20 weeks for an assessment at the paediatric pedi audiology service at Edinburgh Sick Kids. To my dismay, the family have now been told they must wait a further 11 months for any assessment with their daughter currently 778th on the waiting list. I hope that is not too uncomfortable for either the First Minister or the Cabinet Secretary to hear. With progressive hearing loss, a quicker assessment can mean a much better outcome and life for Annika and other children like her. What will the First Minister say to Annika and her family while they wait and wait for what would be almost one quarter of Annika's life? First Minister. In relation to Annika's uh, case, I would be, uh, of course, very willing to look into the particular circumstances of that. Uh, I don't want to see any child uh, waiting that length of time uh, for access to uh, care and treatment that uh, the member is right to say is so important to uh, the, their quality of life. Uh, more generally, there have been, uh, as alluded to, issues uh, with the service uh, in Lothian uh, and the recommendations that uh, came uh, from some of those issues, the vast majority of those have have already been accepted and completed uh, and will continue to work with NHS Lothian to ensure the quality of service uh, that everybody uh, who relies on it has a right to expect. But on the individual case, of course, uh, I will be willing to look into that if the details can be provided to my office. Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of reports today that the projected costs of the new Edinburgh Eye Pavilion have jumped by £10.5 million to £123 million. Given our government's shaky commitment to this vital project in the past, can she reassure patients across the Lothians and South East Scotland today that Edinburgh's new eye pavilion will be a priority for the Scottish Government and that our new eye pavilion will be delivered by 2027? First Minister. I gave that commitment, uh, I think, during the, the last Scottish election. I'm happy to repeat it uh, today, uh, the commitment of this government. It is not shaky, it is rock solid. In terms of construction costs, right, and obviously the business case for that will be interrogated as is uh, normal uh, for all business cases. We are seeing inflation in the cost of construction right now, which is impacting on the cost of many capital projects. Uh, but we have a strong capital programme uh, in the NHS and more generally, and we are committed to delivering it. Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Strike action across the Highlands and Islands network has seen airports, including Sombra, closed since Tuesday. Shetland patients with hospital appointments on the Scottish mainland this week have had to have these rearranged, resulting in delays to treatment and using up precious time and resource within the NHS. High Al is wholly owned by Scottish ministers. So what is the First Minister going to do to secure a resolution and end this disruption to what are lifeline air services? First Minister. Well, can I answer that question briefly in, in two parts? Firstly, in relation to patients uh, whose treatment has been delayed uh, because uh, of this industrial action. Um, I know health boards will be uh, working to ensure uh, that any delays are minimised. Uh, secondly, there is uh, dialogue ongoing to resolve uh, the underlying issue, and I would expect HIAL uh, to do everything possible to reach a resolution uh, to ensure that any further disruption is hopefully avoided completely, uh, but certainly minimised. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's business debate in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton, and there will be a short suspension now to allow those leaving the chamber and public gallery to do so before the debate begins.